Hello, and welcome to ANTS 14. I'm Andrew Sutherland, and I'm going to talk about counting points on superelliptic curves. So let's start with some motivation. Let x be a nice curve, say of genus g, defined over the rational numbers. Then for each prime p where x has good reduction, all but finally many of them, we can consider the reduced curve over fp, and we can count points on it. Now we know that point count is going to have the form p plus 1 minus ap, where ap is the trace of Frobenius, an integer whose absolute value is bounded by 2g times the square root of p. And you can now think of x as a black box into which we insert primes and we get back Frobenius traces. And one could then ask, and many people have asked, how do the Frobenius traces vary as we vary the prime p? And there are many different ways one can consider this question. I've listed some of them here. All of these were originally formulated in the context of elliptic curves, curves of genus one, but they make sense for cur any curve. So for example, you could ask how often is the trace for Frobenius equal to a particular integer? Alternatively, you could normalize your Frobenius traces by dividing by the square root of p and consider the distribution of the corresponding sequence of real numbers on the interval minus 2g to 2g. Another game you can play is to divide the Frobenius traces up into two teams, the positives and the negatives, and ask which team is ahead more often as you look over primes up to some increasing bound. Finally, and most relevant to this talk, one could ask what do the Frobenius traces tell us about the L function of the curve? The original motivation for the conjecture of Birch and Swinnerton Dyer was the observation that if you have an elliptic curve over the rational numbers with large mortal day rank, it's going to have lots and lots of rational points. Those points are going to reduce mod p, and at least for the small primes, you should expect to see a surplus of points mod p. This is going to lead to large negative values of the Frobenius trace, and this is going to make it more likely for the L function to vanish at its central point, and when it does vanish, to vanish to higher order. And this leads to a precise conjecture that in particular predicts that the analytic rank of the L function, its order of vanishing at its central point, should be equal to the mortal day rank of the Jacobian of the curve. Now, very little is known about any of these conjectures for g greater than 1. In some cases, we're not even sure what the right answer should be. And in order to investigate them further, we really need to be able to compute lots of APs. So let me recall the definition of the L function of a curve. This is a Dirichlet series that's defined as an Euler product. And at least a good primes, so the polynomials that appear in the Euler product come from the numerator of the zeta function of the reduction of the curve at p. That zeta function is in turn defined in terms of point counts. And its numerator is an integer polynomial of degree 2g, whose linear term comes from the trace of Frobenius. And it's reciprocal to the characteristic polynomial of the Frobenius endomorphism of the Jacobian of the curve. Now, we would like to compute the cell function. What do I mean by that? Well, I mean, there are infinitely many Dirichlet coefficients. We're never going to compute them all. But we want to compute enough of them so that we can accurately evaluate the function at particular values of s, s equals 1, for example. And in order to do that, we need to know the a sub n up to a bound that's proportional to the square root of the conductor of the Jacobian. Now, we would like to be able to do this as efficiently as possible. And sort of the best we could hope for is a running time that's quasi-linear in our bound n. I mean, we know we have n Dirichlet coefficients to compute, so we really can't hope to do any better than that. Now, because it's defined by an Euler product, the a sub n are completely determined by the values at prime powers n. And if we're considering prime powers up to some bound, almost all of those prime powers are actually primes. So if we can compute the aps quickly, we can afford to take a little more time on the ANs for prime powers n, and there are existing piatic methods that can do easily do this in O of p time, or even in O of square root p time, which is more than fast enough for us to achieve a quasi-linear running time, so long as we can compute the APs in time that's proportional to log p on average. Or said another way, we want an overall running time that looks has the shape n times some power of log n. Now you might ask about the bad primes. I haven't mentioned those. For distributional questions like Lang, Trotter, and Sato Tate, we can ignore them. There's only finally many. When computing an L function, we really do need to know what's happening at the bad primes. But if we're willing to assume that the Hasse-Bey conjecture holds for our L function, that it has an analytic continuation and satisfies the expected functional equation, 
we can use our knowledge of the APs and good primes to deduce the missing Euler factors. Now this requires a lot of APs, perhaps more than we needed to just compute the analytic rank or a bound on the analytic rank, but it still suffices to consider a bound proportional to the square root of the conductor of the Jacobian. Okay, now let's talk about superelliptic curves. For the purposes of this talk, a superelliptic curve is defined by an equation of the form y to the m equals f of x, where m is an integer at least two and f is a polynomial of degree at least three. And we're gonna make two simplifying assumptions. We're gonna assume that the characteristic of whatever field we're working over does not divide m, so the primes p we're interested in are not going to divide m. And we're also going to assume that the polynomial f is separable. That assumption is not strictly necessary, but it simplifies many of the problems we wanna look at. I should note that the definition of the superelliptic curve varies depending on which paper you're reading. Some authors impose more restrictions than we are, and others impose fewer. But the definition we're using is already general enough to include all elliptic curves, hyperelliptic curves, Picard curves, Fermat curves, and many other interesting families. Now, practical average polynomial time point count algorithms are already known for a subset of superelliptic curves, namely the hyperelliptic ones, and also the elliptic curves. So extending those algorithms to superelliptic curves is a natural next step, and that's what we're gonna do. So the problem we wanna consider now is we're given a superelliptic curve over Q, defined by an equation y to the m equals f of x, where f has degree d, at least three, and we wanna compute the Frobenius traces AP for all good primes up to some bound n. And there are three general approaches one might take to this. The first, and prior to this work, the most efficient approach would be to use a piatic algorithm based on a generalization of Harvey's optimization of Kedlias algorithm for hyperelliptic curves. And this algorithm was constructed in a wonderful ANTS 13 paper that obtains a running time that's essentially equivalent to Harvey's result. The dependence, it's proportional to the square root of P and the dependence on M and D is quite good. And so this leads an algorithm that is certainly practical, but it's still not uh, quasi-linear in N. Now you might say, if we're looking for an average polynomial time algorithm, why not actually use a polynomial time algorithm? There are at least theoretical algorithms that can compute not just the APs, but the full zeta function of any curve over a finite field in time that's polynomial in log P. And so the most efficient approach that's known in the case of superelliptic curves is an algorithm due to Adelman and Huang, which appeared in ANTS 1, which is an optimization of Peele's generalization of Scopes algorithm for elliptic curves. And this gives a running time that is polynomial in log P, but the exponent in that polynomial grows rapidly with G. And even for G equals three, the exponent is already too large for this to be practical within the feasible range of N. In this talk, we're gonna present an algorithm that achieves a running time of log p to the fourth on average, and also has good dependence on m and d. Now I should note that you cannot use this algorithm to compute the ap for a particular prime p in time proportional to log p to the fourth. That running time is only an average over all primes up to some bound n. And as in the hyperelliptic case, the average polynomial time approach is not just asymptotically faster, it is faster in practice as we'll see for essentially all values of the parameters. And I'll just note, if you're familiar with the ANTS 13 paper on superelliptic curves, the title of that paper actually refers to cyclic covers, but the class of cyclic covers they consider is precisely the class of superelliptic curves we're talking about here. In particular, they also assume that the polynomial F is separable. Okay. So, to compute the trace of Frobenius of a superelliptic curve, our strategy is to compute it as the trace of a certain matrix over FP. That matrix is the Cartier-Manin matrix, which can be defined as follows. We take the function field of our curve, it has a corresponding module of differentials, and we fix a separ separating element so that we can view the function field as a separable extension of the rational function field over FP. There's then a canonical way to write every element of our function field, well, canonical once we've chosen our separating element X, and this allows us to then define the Cartier operator. We take the 
the last coefficient, the z sub p minus 1 coefficient, that appears in the unique representation of our function z, and we take the corresponding differential. One can also define the Cartier operator axiomatically in terms of properties it satisfies. And this yields a semilinear operator on the space on the module of differentials, and it restricts to an operator on the space of regular differentials. This is a g-dimensional vector space over fp. So if we compute the action of this operator with respect to a chosen basis of regular differentials, we get a g by g matrix with entries in fp. And the trace of this matrix is congruent mod p to the trace of Fermi's. Now, in order to actually compute it, we need to pick a basis, but it doesn't matter which basis we pick, we're still going to get the same trace, and there's a natural choice of basis for superelliptic curves. Okay, the details of the computation of the Cartier-Menin operator are rather involved. That several pages in the paper are devoted to this. I'm not going to discuss those here. I'll just give one example. So let's take a superelliptic curve of the form y to the fifth equals a cubic then the Cartier money matrix is going to have one of the following four forms, depending on the value of p mod 5. And the entries in this matrix are all particular coefficients of particular powers of the polynomial f that defines the curve. And we're now considering this, the reduction of the curve, the curve over fp. So these coefficients are elements of fp. And I'll just note that the coefficient we want and the power of f that we want to take are both linear functions of p and the ratio of the exponent and of, of f and the exponent of x whose coefficient we want to take is a fixed ratio independent of p that's going to be critical to the algorithm okay so we've reduced the problem to extracting certain coefficients from certain powers of the polynomial f let's talk about how to do that efficiently so we take our polynomial f and like any polynomial over any ring, there are two fundamental identities, formal identities it satisfies. Its n plus first power is its nth power times f, and we can take the formal derivative. And if you put those two identities together, you get a linear dependence between any consecutive sequence of d plus one coefficients of the, of the nth power of f. Now for the exponents n of interest to us, these are all gonna be linear uh, functions of p, as I mentioned, we know at the end of the day we're going to be reducing it mod p, and so we may as well reduce the exponent mod p to remove the dependence on p from this linear recurrence, this linear dependence, and we can then write down a matrix with no p's in it, and while we're thinking of these entries as uh, values that we want to compute mod p, they're actually integers, and we can run this recurrence using the same matrix for every prime. The power n and the coefficient, the index of the coefficient k are going to vary with p, but the ratio is constant. And so we can compute a single sequence of the, uh, an initial vector corresponding to the nth power of the constant coefficient of f times a product of integer matrices that we're then going to reduce modulo a particular modulus. The modulus m sub k is going to correspond to a prime p in the case that uh, k is prime, but in general, uh, and for the ones that are not prime, we can simply assume it's one. We don't need to compute the vectors there, but we do need to include those matrices in the product to, in order to run this linear recurrence. Okay, so we've reduced the problem essentially to computing a bunch of partial products of a sequence of matrices reduced modulo a certain sequence of moduli. And there's a standard approach to doing this known as accumulating remainder tree introduced by David Harvey, who developed the very first average polynomial time algorithm. And it works as follows. So given a sequence of n matrices and a sequence of n moduli, we want to compute all of the partial products modulo the corresponding modulus. And one can do this recursively by pairing up matrices and pairing up moduli and reducing to a problem half the size. Solve the subproblem. And you can then solve your original problem by just adjusting the result. So you might need to reduce, do one more modular reduction, or do one more matrix multiplication followed by a modular reduction to get the final result that you want. Now, these are integer matrices that we're multiplying up in a product tree. And these integers are going to get very large at the top of the tree. They're going to have 
at least on the order of n bits, where n is the, our prime bound. And so this computation is very much dominated by the cost of integer multiplication, and it's essential to use fast FFT-based algorithms for this purpose and to take advantage of optimizations one can use when you're multiplying matrices of integers. And this is something that David Harvey has worked on extensively, and he has developed very fast algorithms for doing this, and he has uh, developed a software library that we use in our implementation. But there's a further optimization we can make that is actually uh, quite critical to achieving a practical algorithm. And uh, David and I did this in our, our average polynomial time algorithm for hyperliptic curves, and we want to do the same here, which is to use, rather than just a single remain, remainder tree, a remainder forest, a forest of many remainder trees. This not only saves time, it also saves, sorry, this not only saves space, but this also saves time. So our strategy is we're gonna break our sequence of matrices and our sequence of moduli up into blocks, say of size little n, and we're gonna run the remainder tree algorithm on each block, and we're gonna pass information from one tree of, in the forest to the next using a vector. And that vector will start out as our initial vector v naught, and then at each, as we go through each tree in the forest, we're gonna multiply it by the product of all the matrices in that tree, which appears at the root of the product tree. So here's how the algorithm works. We start with our first block of little n matrices. We compute product trees of matrices and product tree of moduli. We take our vector and we reduce it down the tree. When we go left, we just reduce modulo the modulus on the left child. And when we go right, we multiply by the matrix at the node we're at, and at, at the child and reduce modulo the modulus of the child. And this will eventually lead to the vectors we want appearing at the leaves. And then to move to the next tree, we're going to multiply our vector by a, the product of all the matrices in the tree that we're at. But there's an additional optimization we can make. Remember that at the end of the day, we're only going to be computing these values reduced moduli, modulo a, list, a known list of moduli. And as we move from one tree to the next, we only need to keep track of our, our vector modulo the product of all the remaining moduli. And so by computing an initial product of all the moduli, again using a product tree, we can then reduce that modulus as we move along. And this has the advantage that it actually completely avoids the worst case in the standard remainder tree algorithm. That largest multiplication at the top of the tree, the values of the, the integers that appear there will typically be larger than the product of all the moduli, but you can't reduce them yet, not until you get to the top of the tree. With the remainder forest, you avoid ever having to work with integers that are that large. Okay. So to understand this a little better, I wanted to just show you the remainder forest in action. So here we're using a block size of eight. So we take our first eight matrices, and you should imagine that in parallel, I'm also taking the first eight moduli, and we compute product trees. So we multiply up the tree until we have the product of our eight matrices at the top of the tree. And the same thing for the modulus, for the moduli. Then along comes our initial vector, V naught, and we're actually gonna, uh, first compute the vector we need to pass to the next tree in the forest. That's the product of V naught with the matrix at the top of our product tree. And then we're now going to reduce V naught down the tree. So when we go left, we're just going to reduce V naught modulo the product of the moduli in the left tree. And when we go right, we're going to multiply V naught times the product of the matrices in the right product tree, reduced modulo the product of those moduli. Notice here that the indexes on the moduli are one greater than the indexes on the matrices. That simplifies the presentation. We then continue in this fashion until we reach the leaves where we'll have exactly the vectors that we wanted to compute. And by extracting appropriate elements of those vectors, we can plug them in in the right spot in the Cartier-Manin matrix. We're gonna to have to do several remainder forest algorithms to compute all the rows of the Cartier-Manin matrix. And then at the end, we can take the trace. Okay, so at the end of the day, this produces a very efficient algorithm. So I'm showing here running times that are on average for primes p up to a given bound n reported in milliseconds, and I'm comparing the new algorithm with the implementation of the ANTS 13 algorithm that's in Sage version 9 and later. And each row in this table corresponds to a certain shape of a super elliptic curve. So the first row is a genus one elliptic curve, y squared equals a cubic, so m is two and d is three. For genus two, there are two different shapes of hyperelliptic curves. 
And then in genus three and four, we get a, a wider variety of curves. And as promised, you can see that the new algorithm is substantially faster than do, taking a prime by prime approach using an O of square root of P algorithm, faster by a factor of 100 or even up to a factor of 1,000. Another thing worth noting is that, in some sense, the worst case is the hyperliptic curve case, which has been already treated. And the reason for that is the dependence on M and D. The dependence is M times D cubed. And D, relative to the genus, D is going to be the largest in the hyperliptic case, where M is 2. For other shapes of superliptic curves, the algorithm performs much better. OK. I'll leave you with some references for some of the papers I referred to in this talk. And also, one parting thought. Um, in ANTS 13, we saw a new algorithm for point counting on superliptic curves that was an order of magnitude faster than the best known previous algorithm due to Min's law. And in ANTS 14, we've again seen an order of magnitude improvement over the algorithm in ANTS 13. So this makes me very much looking forward to ANTS 15, where I hope to see that someone has found a way to knock another order of magnitude off the running time of point counting on superliptic curves. Thank you.